I'm glad you could join us. Go ahead and stab the like button and stick around for the next untold story. In the spring of 1989, a year after graduating from Northwestern University, Emily Richardson, an aspiring journalist, received her first major assignment. She was to write a detailed feature on John Wayne Gacy, the infamous killer clown who had been executed in 1980. Gacy's horrific crimes, in which he murdered at least 33 young men and boys, had shocked the nation. Emily's task was to explore the lasting impact on the community of Norwood Park, Chicago, where Gacy had lived and committed his atrocities. Emily arrived in Norwood Park with mixed feelings of excitement and dread. The suburban neighborhood appeared normal enough, with neatly kept lawns and children playing in the streets. But beneath the surface, the memories of Gacy's gruesome acts lingered like a dark cloud. Her first interview was with Detective Robert Hansen, one of the investigators who had helped uncover Gacy's crimes. Detective Hansen was a grizzled veteran with a weary expression, the years of dealing with the aftermath of Gacy's horrors etched into his face. We were just doing our jobs, Hansen said, his voice gravelly. But what we found in that house, dot dot dot, IT quote S something you can't forget, even now, years later, it haunts me. Emily leaned forward, her notepad ready. Can you describe what it was like when you first entered Gacy's house? Hansen sighed deeply. The smell was the first thing that hit us, decay and death. The crawl space under the house was where we found most of the bodies, buried in shallow graves. It was a nightmare, digging them out, one by one. As he spoke, Emily could almost see the scene in her mind, the cramped, dark crawl space, the sense of horror as the bodies were uncovered. She shivered, trying to focus on her questions. How did the community react? She asked. What impact did Gacy's crimes have on the people who lived here? Hansen shook his head. People were terrified. Parents wouldn't let their kids out of their sight. Neighbors who had known Gacy for years were in shock. They couldn't believe that the friendly contractor who dressed as a clown for children's parties could be a monster. Determined to capture the full scope of the story, Emily visited the site of Gacy's former house. The house itself had been demolished, and a new, innocuous home now stood in its place. But the ground beneath held the memories of unimaginable horror. As she stood there, imagining the events that had taken place, she felt a chill run down her spine. She spoke with the new homeowners, who had moved in shortly after the demolition. They were reluctant to talk, but eventually shared their own experiences. Sometimes, late at night, we hear strange noises, Mrs. Collins, the current owner, admitted, her voice trembling. Tapping sounds, whispers, it's like the house is still haunted by what happened here. Emily felt a growing sense of unease. The more she learned about Gacy's crimes, the more she felt the darkness that still lingered in Norwood Park. She decided to visit the local library to research more about the neighborhood's history and any other strange occurrences. At the library, she found old newspaper clippings and records that detailed the community's response to Gacy's arrest and the subsequent trial. But she also discovered something unsettling. Several reports of mysterious disappearances dating back decades, long before Gacy had moved to the area. Intrigued, Emily delved deeper uncovering stories of a shadowy figure that had been seen lurking in the neighborhood for years. Some locals believed that the area was cursed, that the land itself was tainted by a dark presence. One evening, while sifting through the old records, Emily felt a cold draft pass through the library. The lights flickered and she heard a faint, rhythmic tapping. She looked around, but the library was empty. Shaking off her fear, she continued her research, determined to get to the bottom of the mystery. That night, back in her hotel room, Emily had trouble sleeping. She kept hearing the tapping sound, growing louder and more insistent. She got up and walked to the window but saw nothing unusual. The tapping seemed to come from the walls themselves, echoing through the room. The next day, she interviewed more residents, gathering their stories and trying to piece together the puzzle. One man, Mr. Thompson, had lived in the neighborhood for over 50 years. His eyes were haunted as he spoke about the past. I remember seeing Gacy around, he said, his voice low. He seemed like a regular guy, but after he was caught, people started talking about the strange things that had been happening for years. 
disappearances, odd sounds, shadows that moved on their own. Emily felt a chill as she listened. Do you think there's something more to it? Something beyond Gacy? Thompson nodded slowly. I think there's a darkness here. Something that's always been here. Gacy was just a part of it. Whatever it is, it feeds on fear and suffering. Determined to find answers, Emily decided to stay in the neighborhood overnight, hoping to experience the strange occurrences firsthand. She set up her equipment in a guest room at the Collins house, preparing for a long night. As the hours passed, the house was eerily quiet. Around midnight, the tapping began. Emily turned on her recorder and flashlight, following the sound. It led her to the basement, where the air grew colder with each step. In the basement, the tapping was louder, more frantic. Emily scanned the room, her flashlight beam cutting through the darkness. She felt a presence, something watching her. The hairs on the back of her neck stood up as she approached a corner of the room where the tapping was strongest. Suddenly, the light flickered, and she saw a shadowy figure in the corner, its eyes glowing with a cold, malevolent light. Emily froze, her breath catching in her throat. The figure stepped forward, its form becoming more solid, and she recognized the face of John Wayne Gacy, his expression twisted with a sinister smile. You shouldn't have come here, the figure hissed, its voice echoing with an unnatural resonance. The darkness is eternal. Emily backed away, her heart pounding. She grabbed her recorder and began to chant the cleansing incantation she had learned from a local psychic, hoping to banish the spirit. The figure recoiled slightly, but then advanced, its form growing more menacing. You think you can stop me? It taunted. You are mine. Desperate, Emily threw the vial of holy water at the figure. It shattered, and the room exploded with light. The figure screamed, its form disintegrating into a cloud of dark mist. The tapping ceased, and the oppressive presence lifted. Breathing heavily, Emily fell to her knees, tears streaming down her face. She had done it. She had banished the darkness. But as she caught her breath, a new realization dawned on her. The battle might be over, but the scars would remain. The next morning, Emily spoke with the Collins family, sharing her experiences and assuring them that the darkness had been confronted. She knew that while the spirit of Gacy might have been banished, the trauma he had inflicted on the community would take much longer to heal. As she prepared to leave Norwood Park, Emily felt a sense of closure. She had faced the darkness and survived, but she also knew that the echoes of Gacy's crimes would linger, a chilling reminder of the evil that can lurk behind a friendly facade. The story of John Wayne Gacy and his haunting legacy became another whispered legend, a cautionary tale for those who dared to uncover the secrets of the past. And as Emily left Norwood Park, she knew that the darkness was always watching, always waiting, ready to claim the next soul that ventured too close. Emily left Norwood Park, but the memories of her experience haunted her. The tapping sound, the malevolent presence, and the sinister figure of John Wayne Gacy replayed in her mind. Despite her efforts to distance herself from the horrors she had uncovered, the darkness seemed to follow her. Back in Chicago, Emily threw herself into her work, determined to use her platform to share the stories of Gacy's victims and the lingering impact on the community. Her articles received widespread attention, and she found herself in demand for interviews and speaking engagements. Yet, the more she spoke about Gacy, the more she felt the shadows creeping back into her life. One night, while preparing for a late-night interview, Emily heard the familiar tapping sound again. It was faint at first, barely noticeable above the noise of the city outside her apartment. But as the night wore on, the tapping grew louder and more insistent. She tried to ignore it, telling herself it was just her imagination, but the sound seemed to be coming from the walls themselves. Determined to confront whatever was happening, Emily decided to visit the old archives where she had found the initial reports of Gacy's crimes. She hoped to find more information that might help her understand the darkness that seemed to be following her. The archives were located in the basement of a decrepit building in downtown Chicago, filled with dusty files and forgotten documents. As she pored over the old records, Emily stumbled upon a series of letters that Gacy had written while he was in prison. They were addressed to a mysterious correspondent known only as A. The letters were filled with chilling details about his crimes and bizarre references to a dark entity that he claimed had driven him to kill. 
One passage stood out. The darkness is eternal. It chose me, and it will choose others. It cannot be stopped. Emily felt a shiver run down her spine. She realized that the darkness she had encountered in Norwood Park was not just the lingering presence of Gacy, but something far older and more malevolent. It had latched onto Gacy, using him as a vessel for its evil, and now it had latched onto her. Determined to find answers, Emily reached out to Dr. Helen Carter, a renowned psychologist who had studied the minds of serial killers, including Gacy. Dr. Carter agreed to meet with her, intrigued by her findings. Emily, the human mind is a complex and fragile thing, Dr. Carter explained during their meeting. People like Gacy often claim to be driven by external forces, whether real or imagined. But what you're describing sounds like something more paranormal. Emily shared her experiences in Norwood Park, the tapping sounds, and the malevolent presence that seemed to follow her. Dr. Carter listened intently, her expression growing more concerned. There's a theory in psychology called the collective unconscious, Dr. Carter said. It suggests that certain symbols, fears, and archetypes are shared by all humans. Sometimes, in cases of extreme trauma or evil, these archetypes can take on a life of their own, almost like a haunting. Emily felt a chill as she listened. So, you're saying that the darkness is a manifestation of collective fear and trauma? Possibly, Dr. Carter replied. But whatever it is, it seems to have latched onto you because of your connection to Gacy's story. You need to find a way to break that connection. That night, Emily returned to her apartment, feeling a mix of fear and determination. She decided to conduct her own investigation into the origins of the darkness that had plagued Gacy and now seemed to be haunting her. She began to research ancient texts and folklore, looking for any clues that might help her understand and combat the malevolent force. As she delved deeper into the occult, she discovered references to a demonic entity known as the Shadow Man, a being that fed on fear and suffering. According to legend, the Shadow Man could be summoned through dark rituals and would bind itself to those who performed the rites, driving them to commit unspeakable acts. Emily realized that Gacy must have somehow summoned the Shadow Man, either intentionally or unintentionally, and that the entity had used him to spread its evil. She knew she had to find a way to banish the Shadow Man once and for all, to break the cycle of darkness. With Dr. Carter's help, Emily located a specialist in occult practices, Father Michael O'Connor, a priest who had dealt with demonic possessions and hauntings. Father O'Connor agreed to meet with her and perform a ritual to banish the Shadow Man. The ritual was to be conducted in an abandoned church on the outskirts of Chicago, a place that Father O'Connor believed would provide the spiritual strength needed to combat the darkness. As Emily and the priest prepared for the ritual, the tapping sound returned, louder and more insistent than ever. You must remain strong, Father O'Connor said, lighting candles and placing protective symbols around the room. The darkness will try to break you, but you must not give in. As they began the ritual, the air grew cold, and the shadows in the room seemed to come alive, swirling around them. Father O'Connor chanted in Latin, calling upon divine forces to banish the Shadow Man. Emily felt the oppressive presence closing in on her, the tapping growing deafening. Suddenly, the room was filled with a blinding light, and the figure of the Shadow Man appeared, its eyes burning with malevolence. You cannot defeat me, it hissed, its voice echoing with an otherworldly resonance. The darkness is eternal. Father O'Connor continued to chant, his voice rising above the chaos. The light grew brighter, and the Shadow Man screamed, its form beginning to unravel. Emily felt a surge of hope as the entity writhed and twisted, fighting against the purification. But just as it seemed that they might succeed, the light flickered, and the Shadow Man lunged at Emily, its cold hand wrapping around her throat. She gasped for breath, struggling to break free, but its grip tightened pulling her closer. You belong to me, it whispered, its voice echoing with countless others. You will never escape. Emily felt her strength fading, the darkness closing in. But then, with a final desperate effort, she reached out and grabbed Father O'Connor's crucifix, holding it up to the Shadow Man. The entity screamed, its form disintegrating into a cloud of dark mist. The light returned, and the oppressive presence lifted, Emily fell to the ground, gasping for breath, tears streaming down her face. 
Father O'Connor helped her to her feet, his expression weary but triumphant. It's over, he said softly. The darkness is gone. Emily nodded, feeling a sense of relief and exhaustion. She knew that while the Shadow Man had been banished, the scars of her experience would remain. But she also knew that she had faced the darkness and survived, and that she would continue to fight against the evil that lurked in the shadows. As she left the church, Emily felt a renewed sense of purpose. She would use her platform to share the stories of those who had suffered, to shine a light on the darkness, and to help others find the strength to confront their own demons. And though the tapping sound might never truly disappear, she knew that she had the power to face it and to continue her fight against the darkness. In the weeks following the ritual, Emily tried to regain a sense of normalcy. She wrote her articles, sharing the stories of Gacy's victims and the eerie experiences she had encountered. The tapping had ceased, and she believed that the darkness had been vanquished. But the feeling of being watched never truly left her. One evening, as she was finishing an article, Emily received a call from Detective Hansen. His voice was tense and filled with concern. Emily, we need to talk. It's about the Collins family. Her heart sank. What happened? They've been hearing the tapping again. Mrs. Collins called me last night, terrified. She said she saw a figure in their basement. I think the darkness might not be gone after all. Emily felt a cold chill run down her spine. I'll be there as soon as I can. She arrived at the Collins house, the oppressive atmosphere returning the moment she stepped inside. The family looked exhausted, their faces etched with fear. Mrs. Collins led her to the basement where the tapping was loud and persistent. I thought we got rid of it, Emily whispered, her voice trembling. Whatever it is, it's back, Mrs. Collins replied, her voice breaking. And it's stronger than before. Emily knew they needed to act quickly. She called Dr. Carter and Father O'Connor, explaining the situation. They agreed to meet at the house that night to perform another ritual, hoping to banish the darkness once and for all. As the sun set, the team gathered in the basement, preparing for the ritual. The air was thick with tension, and the tapping grew louder, echoing through the house. Shadows danced along the walls, and the temperature dropped, a palpable sense of dread settling over them. Father O'Connor began the ritual, his voice strong and commanding. Dr. Carter stood beside him, her eyes scanning the room for any signs of the entity. Emily held the crucifix tightly, ready to confront whatever emerged from the darkness. Suddenly, the lights flickered, and the tapping ceased. The room was plunged into an eerie silence, broken only by the sound of their breathing. The shadows coalesced into a dark figure, its eyes glowing with malevolence. You cannot defeat me, it hissed, its voice echoing with an otherworldly resonance. The darkness is eternal. Father O'Connor continued to chant, his voice rising above the chaos. The figure screamed, its form beginning to unravel. But then, with a final desperate effort, it lunged at Emily, its cold hand wrapping around her throat. You belong to me, it whispered, its voice echoing with countless others. You will never escape. Emily gasped for breath, struggling to break free. She felt her strength fading, the darkness closing in. But then, with a final desperate effort, she held up the crucifix, pressing it against the figure. The entity screamed, its form disintegrating into a cloud of dark mist. The light returned, and the oppressive presence lifted. Emily fell to the ground, gasping for breath, tears streaming down her face. Father O'Connor helped her to her feet, his expression weary but triumphant. It's over, he said softly. The darkness is gone. Emily nodded, feeling a sense of relief and exhaustion. She knew that while the entity had been banished, the scars of her experience would remain but she also knew that she had faced the darkness and survived, and that she would continue to fight against the evil that lurked in the shadows. As she left the house, Emily felt a renewed sense of purpose. She would use her platform to share the stories of those who had suffered, to shine a light on the darkness, and to help others find the strength to confront their own demons. And though the tapping sound might never truly disappear, she knew that she had the power to face it and to continue her fight against the darkness. But as Emily walked to her car, she heard a faint, rhythmic tapping. Her heart pounded as she turned to look at the house, the windows dark and lifeless. The tapping grew louder, more insistent, 
echoing through the night. She felt a cold hand on her shoulder and spun around, her eyes wide with fear. There, standing in the shadows, was the figure of John Wayne Gacy, his eyes glowing with malevolence. You can never escape, he whispered, his voice echoing with countless others. The darkness is eternal. Emily screamed, but the sound was swallowed by the darkness. The tapping grew deafening, drowning out her thoughts. She struggled to break free, but the darkness tightened its grip, pulling her into the void. The next morning, Emily's car was found abandoned outside the Collins house, her belongings untouched. There was no sign of struggle, no indication of where she had gone. The only clue was a single chilling sentence scrawled in fresh ink on the ground. The darkness has claimed another. The story of Emily Richardson and her investigation into John Wayne Gacy's haunting legacy became another whispered legend, a cautionary tale for those who dared to uncover the secrets of the past. And the darkness, ever patient, waited for its next victim, knowing that some evils never truly disappear. The tapping continued, echoing through the empty halls, a chilling reminder that the darkness was always watching, always waiting ready to claim the next soul that ventured too close. Thank you for listening. Now watch this video, 